Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello, the best exemplar of metaphysical poetry is of course, John Den who was born in 1572 in the Elizabethan period continued to live in the early 17th century in both King James the first period and also in King Charles the first period. We will look into such historical and literary context first, see John Den the poet and priest. We will read two poems first, these are sonnets that be not proud though some have called thee. I am a little world made cunningly, this is a second sonnet, these are called holy sonnets. We will pay more attention to one poem, the sun rising, analyze it and then offer two readings, one is historical, another is an echo feminist reading. The historical and literary context in which John Den operated was full of conflict between the Catholics and the Protestants. They suspected each other and they were persecuting each other and some of them were hiding or going into exile. The kings need to pacify both groups and remain in power was something no one would envy. There were of course, conversions from one group to another. In the case of John Den, we find him to convert himself from Roman Catholic Church to Anglican Church. He was educated well and he had an aspiration to obtain a government position or become a priest. He had to suffer a lot because he could not get both easily. At this time, we find colonial and imperial expansions. John Den also wanted to join this trading companies in America, but he could not succeed. And at this time also we find many of those Elizabethan writers writing different kinds of literary pieces including dramatic poetry. John Den was born in a mercantile family that practiced Catholic religion. As a Catholic, he was discriminated on account of his own religious practice. He wanted to pursue law and joined Lord Essex in his military expeditions. What happened was, he loved one lady called Anne Moore, she was a relative of his boss Lord Egerton and he secretly married her in 1601. As a consequence, he had to suffer many deprivations including imprisonment, poverty and neglect. As a result, he turned to asceticism and followed intellectual pursuits. And as part of his negotiating with the difficult times that he had to live through, he experimented with different forms of writings, sermons, satires, lyrics, sonnets, elegies and so on. When he did not get any government job, he accepted the minimum thing that he could do that is to become a priest. But priesthood did not prevent him from writing poetry. To become the priest, he had to convert himself to the Church of England. In 1615, the King James the first appointed him a preacher and also helped him to get this Doctor of Divinity award from Cambridge University. Later, King James the first also offered him a covetable post that is the Deanship of St. Paul's Cathedral. John Dan was an excellent orator, a preacher. So, he enthralled his audience as a preacher. 
he became very successful because he was using a particular structure for his sermons. Perhaps that could be a model for many of us. He would take a passage from the Bible, explicate the Bible passage, illustrate it from various sources and then apply the ideas from the Bible to real life situations. So, this is a tripartite structure that he used in his sermons, explication, illustration and application. He was a bold and original experimental poet in his own inimitable style. He published some uh, poems, but many of his poems were published not in his lifetime, but after his death. Satires and elegies, songs and sonnets, sermons, his collected poems, they were all published in 1633. We will discuss two sonnets. As you mentioned, we will also examine one particular poem, The Sun Rising. Even today, death is the greatest theme for literature, for poets, for everybody. That is the reality that all of us have to live through. John Den was very aware of the presence of death in his life. So, here is a remarkable poem on the theme of death. He addresses death directly with so much of optimism. Death be not proud, though some have called thee mighty and dreadful, for thou art not so. For those whom thou thinkest thou dost overthrow, die not poor death, nor yet canst thou kill me from breast and sleep which but thy pictures be, much pleasure then from thee much more must flow. And soonest our best men will thee, thee do go, rest of their bones and souls delivery, thou art slave to fate, chance, kings and desperate men, and does with poison, war and sickness dwell, and poppy or charms can make us sleep as well, and better than thy stroke. Why swellest thou then? One short sleep past, we wake eternally, and death shall be no more. Death, thou shalt die. Here, he addresses death directly with so much of determination, courage to say, Death, thou shalt die. This is a kind of declaration that he makes in his poem, in his sonnet, a very famous sonnet. Now, let us see another sonnet, where he says, I am a little world made cunningly of elements and an angelic spirit, but black sin hath betrayed to endless night my worlds, both parts and oh, both parts must die. You which beyond that heaven which was most high have found new spheres and of new lands can write, poor news is in my eyes that so I might drown my world with my weeping earnestly, or wash it if it must be drowned no more. But oh, it must be burnt, alas, the fire of lust and envy have burnt heretofore and made it fouler. Let their flames retire and burn me, O Lord with a fiery zeal of thee and thy house which doth in eating heal. This is a world that he creates himself cunningly, the metaphysical aspect of addressing death so closely and here addressing the Lord so casually, suggesting the idea of religious resurrection and also living in poetry forever. Here is this poem, The Sun Rising. We have three stanzas. So, one after another, we will see these three stanzas. We have to remember those features of metaphysical poetry. We can see them easily here. This casual, colloquial, plain language, far-fetched metaphor and all the paradoxical language, argumentative language and all that we can see in this poem. 
Busy world fall and really send why does thou this through windows and through curtains call on us. Must to thy emotions lower season run? Sassy pedantic wretch, go chide, late school boys and sour practices. Go tell court handsmen that the king will ride, call country ants to harvest offices, love all alike, noses and nose, nor claim, nor hours, days, months, which are the rags of time. The second stanza, thy beam so reverend and strong, why should as thou think? I could eclipse and cloud them with a wink, but that I would not lose her sight so long, if her eyes have not blinded thine, look and tomorrow lay tell me, whether both the Indias of spies and mine, be where thou leftest them, or lie here with me. Ask for those kings whom thou sawest yesterday, and thou shalt hear, all here in one bed lay. The third stanza. She is all states and all princes I, nothing else is. Princes do but play us compared to this. All honor is mimic, all wealth alchemy. Thou son art half as happy as we in that the world is contracted thus. Thine age ask ease and since thy duties be to warm the world that is done in warming us, shine here to us and thou and, ev and everywhere. This bed, thy center is, these walls, thy sphere. We have a list of questions for discussion for better understanding of this poem. What is the title of the poem? The sun rising. What does the whole poem deal with? Theme of love. There is a, an interaction between this, the poet and the sun. The sun is addressed by the poet directly. The po the lover is there along with him. How does the poem begin? The poet addresses the son directly, busy old fool. How does it progress? The poet piles up images after images to suggest that his world is better than the world visited by the son. How does it end? He tells the son to warm up his own bed and he could find everything here itself. What linguistic and rhetorical strategies does the poet employ to achieve his effect on the reader? Of course, the features that we have identified colloquial language, metaphorical images, paradoxical images or language, familiarity with the sun, everything he brings them together here. What is the tone of the poem? Conversational tone of course, love, son, world and reader all are brought together. There is a world that we can see, there is a stage on which the world of love is brought before us. We have one question for which do, we do not have an answer. Why is the woman silent? One thing that we can say is, this is a poem written by a man. So, the woman does not have some voice we can say. At the same time, we have to think about the colonial context, the imperial context in which Dan was writing. Britishers were expanding themselves, they were conquering every other land that was possible for them. So, conquering the earth has something to do with the woman as well. Colonizing, conquering the earth is part of this silencing one huge voice of women. If we follow our oppositional strategy of looking at the thematic contrast in the poem, we can see love and God, time, destiny, man, son that is nature and humanity or culture, the individual and the state, east and west. Remember Dan mentions India's of spice and mine empire and colony that is Britain and rest of the areas, man and woman of course, the woman is there though silent. We also have the background context of protestant and catholic. Most importantly, we have this interplay between science and religion. We have to always remember that John Den was interested in science, he was a priest, he was interested in government, he was interested in ordinary way of life, he loved a woman 
with all his heart and married her secretly against the wishes of his own boss and suffered enormously. He was interested in the various kinds of conceptions of the earth, geocentric universe, heliocentric universe. He was interested in and he was also exploring the theocentric universe that is God made the whole world. But we notice something very interesting, Eurocentric world we can say, we can play with as done does, E U R O, Euro European world, E R O from Eros, European imperial and Eros, Eurocentric we can notice within this poem, the bed on which he stays and he wants the sun to bless him with light, warmth, everything for his own happiness. Many poetic devices are there in this uh, poem of 13 lines. Apostrophe is the first one we can notice, there is a direct address to the sun. We have the sun being personified as an old man. We also have oxymoronic language, paradoxical language as busy old fool, an old person is not so busy, but you can see busy old fool. We have the case of a rhetorical question, must to thy emotions lover cease and run? Dan emphatically says, no, you do your job, we do our job. And there are many images in terms of metaphors and things like that, schoolboys, apprentices, huntsmen, king, ants, rags of time. The conceit is an extended met metaphor, the sun's rays is something very interesting here. Dan says, he could eclipse the sun with a wink, but he does not want to do it because he does not want to take away his eyes from his own beloved. He wants to keep his eyes fixed on his beloved and so he does not want to look at the rays of the sun. This is a kind of wit, intellectually witty comparison, far-fetched comparison that we can see. Also we notice hyperbole when it comes to comparing his own love with the India's of spice and mine. Nothing in the world is so precious as his own love. On the one hand, we can see materialistic love expanding the world, conquering the world, bringing all wealth to England. On the other hand, Dunn stays in London and he considered his own love to be the greatest wealth on the earth. Obviously, he plays with the idea of sun, yes, yen, yes, yen. And also he plays with mine, mining and taking some minerals from the mines and also mining his own bed, mining his own love and being happy with the resources, the riches that he gets out of his own love. The rhyme, rhythm and meter of this poem are interesting by themselves. We have three stanzas, each stanza has this rhyme scheme. A, B, B, A, C, D, C, D, E, E. So, 10 lines we have. The rhyming words are sun, thus, as, run, chide, prentice, ride, offices, claim, time. The rhythm is variable because the line lengths vary. But basically, we have iambic in this poem. What we have is alternating tetrameter, dimeter and pentameter, tetra 4, di 2 and penta 5. These alternating rhymes, meters indicate the movement of the sun going around the world. Let us look at some examples for these variable meters. Busy old fool, unruly sun, we have 8 syllables, 4 feet and we have trochee, spondy and I am in the first line. We can uh, read this in this way, dum da, dum dum, da dum, da dum that is trochee, spondy and then I am. The next example that we have is, why does thou thus? It is a short line of 4 syllables and 2 feet, here we have dum da dum da to mean trucky and we have another line 
where we have all 10 syllables and 5 feet through windows and through curtains colonnades. So, this kind of variety itself is uh, indicative of the energy the dynamism that Dunn brings into the poem because the kind of love that he deals with is energetic love. <coughs> In this poem we find personification and presentation of the sun as a foolish old man throughout the poem. It is a conceit, it is extended in many ways in three different stanzas. In stanza 1, the speaker complains about the entry of the sun rays into his bedroom and chides, rebukes the sun to go and leave him alone. And in stanza 2, the speaker considers love's riches to be more powerful than anything else in the world. And in stanza 3, the speaker eclipses the sun into his bed, which is the center of the universe for the lovers. And also in this universe, he includes, he co-opts the sun as well. What is the use of that heliocentric world going around the world, come here to this ERO, Eurocentric world. He says, the lovers world is superior to all other worlds. So, the sun rising is uh, full of energy touching the heart and mind of every reader who comes into contact with the sun rising. This is an interesting historical reading I have attempted on my own without any critical reference. Some of you may try this. The sun rising is a poem that plays with the word sun in two different ways. One sun actually the planet sun rising and S O N the sun who is the result of the kind of relationship between a man and woman, some reproduction if you call it. What I consider in this poem is this sun S O N is the son of King James the first that is Charles the first. When King James the first died in 1625, his own son Charles I became the first king of England who was born in the church of England, the protestant church of England. That is something remarkable we have to notice. The king was rising as an imperial king. This personification, this symbol, perhaps this address to the son may be an address to the king as well. This king Charles I loved his wife and listened to his wife and he did not pay much attention to the kingdom or the empire the way in the way in which he ought to have done. What he did was he quarreled with the parliament. He did not convene the parliament for many years, nearly a decade and the lords and barons they became upset and they became restless and that is why they had to indulge in civil war with their own king. And the result finally was King Charles I was defeated and executed and then the people's government that is the commonwealth government came into existence. At this time science and trade were developing very fast and then also married and more secretly and suffered deprivations in his own life. So, this is the kind of historical reading that I thought would be interesting for us to look into in this poem. We have another quite uh, interesting reading of this poem called an eco feministic reading from one critic Phillips. From this essay what we find is this. Men and women poets of the 17th century approached gender, nature and colonialism differently. Eco-criticism, post-colonialism and eco-feminism all together create contexts of political activism about the metaphor of the earth as mother. Women and earth are connected in some way because of this capacity for reproduction and nourishment. John Dunn the poet and priest was keenly interested in the Virginia company which explored 
enjoyed and exploited both land and women in America in that colony called Virginia. So, Phillips calls this poem the sun rising a text of colonization and mining. <coughs> colonizing women, colonizing earth both go together according to him. The woman or land is East Indies of spice and West Indies of mineral wealth. By paying close attention to this poem with historical details, Phillips offers this eco feminist reading which you could appreciate. Now, to sum up, John Dunn, the 17th century poet, priest, has written a number of poems, and we have chosen two sonnets and one song or one poem in general for our study in this lecture. We refer to death be not proud though some have called thee. We also read I am a little world made cunningly. These two poems sonnets are at the back of my mind when we read any kind of poem with some kind of metaphysical strain particularly Emily Dickinson will come to us when we read this poem I am a little world made cunningly. We examine the sun rising closely and offered a historical reading and also an eco feminist reading. When we read the poems of John Dunn, we come into contact with his own voice, with, with his own speech pattern. He addresses the sun directly. We participate in this poem as implied listeners. We see the stage, we see the drama of love enacted in front of our eyes. Some references will help you to understand John Dan and this particular poem much more. If you are interested in exploring the eco-feministic dimension a little more, perhaps you could refer to this article by B. Phillips. This is called The Rape of Mother Earth in 17th Century English Poetry and Eco-Feminist Interpretation. Thank you.